This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists only to entertain. In 1929 Germany, a physician is frustrated, sitting at his desk, trying to figure out a way to fix problems with the heart in the least invasive way possible. I don't get it. There has to be a way to see und heart while it's beating, to figure out why it's not moving so good. Come in already. Who is breaking my concentration? Yeah, hey, pal, a uh, hospital plumber here. You, you got something going on with your sink? What? Oh, yeah, the drain is plugged all day. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to look into that for you. Why all the racket? I can't zinc under these circumstances. Hey, hey, you want your sink to drain or not? I got to use my tools. Sorry, but they're heavy and noisy. And Oh, hey, hey, is that a picture? That picture over there, is, it? is that the heart? Yes, it's a heart. A heart with the problem I'm trying to fix if I can get some quiet time around here. Oh, look at that pipe right there. Looks like it ain't draining too good either, huh? Well, you're right. It's blocked. No blood goes through the corner artery and no blood gets to the heart muscle. Boom. That's the problem I need to figure out. Sounds like you know the problem. What you need, pal, you need a good snake. What are you talking about? Why would I want a snake? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, look, look, see here. Yeah, th this thing right here is a drain snake. You got a blockage in a pipe, you snake it out, huh? I mean, you can try Drano or whatever, but you're going to go in there, you're going to wiggle this little guy around and see, get a little water through it. I mean, simple as that. I mean, check this out. See? No more blocked up pipes. You got to gotta, gotta get a snake, get around the curves or whatever, too. You know, just kind of make it a little flexible. Aye, you are a genius. I need to make a snake for human pipes. At least one that will let me look at them. So many possibilities. I, I'd wash it off real good first. He's getting a little grimy. Oh, no, thank you for the idea. I will get to work on this, this now. And no problem, buddy. Say, you get all famous or whatnot. You think you can cut me in on some of the Nobel Prize money? Yeah, um, maybe I'll think about it. Yeah, sure. That, that sounds good. Uh, oh, one more thing. Yeah? You know, seeing how it's 1920s Germany, you're not, you're not going to, like, be a Nazi later, are you? Oh, yeah. I absolutely will join the Nazis. I'm hoping to be captured by the Americans later, though. That's not great. Uh, I mean, it could be worse. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friend and colleague, Mike. Mike, why does Aaron keep going on vacation? I don't know, but he does travel well. He goes to cool places. He does, but he avoids being on the show when he does that, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He was yeah. snorkeling in Sweden or Norway, which is, you'd think it would be pretty cool. I don't know. The beach looked beautiful. It did. I guess they do get some sun up there every once in a while. <laughs> well, Aaron is uh, Aaron's across the other side of the world, and he didn't want to record today. So fine, we'll push on without him. But uh, that's okay. We've got a really cool show today, uh, including, of course, a trivia question from Mike to fail at, and uh, we have a special guest. <laughs> so stick around, hear about the topic of medical advances in heart disease. But first, a word from our sponsor, Artery Inc. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Artery Inc. You know, it's summer, it's farmer's market season, and we're going to be talking about the history of modern cardiology on this episode. What do those things have in common? Well, Artery Inc.'s new heartbeat design. Is heartbeat like, like heart and beat the vegetable? So it's a new shirt featuring that exact design, which you'll have to kind of see to appreciate it in all of its glory. And look, I'm going to be honest, I personally don't like beets, like the vegetable, not the not not the heartbeats. I do appreciate when patients' hearts are beating. I, I promise you that. But I do love a good, delicious visual anatomy pun, and I think you should as well. So go over to www.arteryinc.com, that is I-N-K, to check out this fun shirt and use our promo code Listen to PHP to save 10% on orders over $35, which will buy you a bunch of those shirts, by the way. 
And uh, I do love me a good farmer's market. I think looking good while cruising for veggies is a bonus. Please note that that code does not apply to subscription boxes, however. All right, let's get back to the show. And welcome back. Let's uh, get going a little bit with Mike's Trivia Challenge. So this is the, uh, the time before we get to our guests. Let's just see what Mike knows or does not know, and he tries to confidently pretend like he knows and see if he gets it right. If he uh, is able to answer the question correctly, uh, it hasn't happened yet, so I don't really know what we do for that. Uh, but if he fails the question, then we go ahead and award a medical eponym to the person who sent the question. And so, Mike, this week's question comes from the Lancaster Medical Heritage Museum, the Medical Museum. You may remember them, mm-hmm. right? I do. They, mm-hmm. they, they were kind enough to send us the question this week, uh, and uh, everybody go check them out on all the social medias. They are definitely friends from the show. And well, hello, Kim. Thanks for, thanks for the question. So, uh, Mike, here's your question. You ready? I'm ready. I always get nervous. It's dumb. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> All right. I, I, well, there's almost nothing writing on it. So prior to the discovery of blood typing and whatnot for, you know, safe blood transfusions, what substance was injected through an IV for the first time in 1847, which was instead of blood, with the expectation that somehow it wouldn't kill the patient? Well, yeah, back before we could type for a blood transfusion, we, we needed to deliver some nutrients into the system as somebody that was in hemorrhagic shock. So the first substance was horse serum. Hmm. Um, so they they would take all the serum out of the horse, or they take the blood out of the horses, spin it down to serum. Uh, the horse would then get turned into glue. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so it was horse serum. It was actually fairly widely used in, until 1847 and a half. Mm, indeed. Uh, incorrect possibly borderline offensive but incorrect why well. oh the glue part yeah, glue. people don't like horses being turned into glue even though it does it's happen it's thing. sad well, does it i don't know doesn't have to do with the transfusion but you know, what, Mike, you know what the they answer don't is? feel that sticky no no that's... clearly don't <laughs> melting process um milk cow's mm. milk so Toronto, 1854, doctors James Bovell and Edwin Hodder, which were like super close to bovine and udder, like in the names, I just mm-hmm. couldn't quite make them work. Uh, they injected milk into a person thinking the white bits of the milk would like become white blood cells <laughs> because uh, I guess, I don't know, the same color track seems like solid scientific logic. Yeah. Uh, so the patients that they... Yeah, exactly. And it's nutritious, right? We get raised on milk. So, I mean, I guess I can see how we they might have thought that. Uh, but the patient was a 40-year-old man who got about 12 ounces of cow's milk IV and uh, did not die. Uh, hmm. I don't know that he did well. I didn't find that. But he did not die. And so he said, you know what? This is awesome. And they tried it on five more patients, and those patients all definitely died. Uh, <laughs> so oh, no. that's um, that's this was you would think that would be enough to stop it. But apparently this was a somewhat common intermittent practice up until uh, 1884 when they finally decided uh, not to do it anymore. But they tried other things. They were like, maybe it's the cow's milk. So let's try goat's milk and mm. let's try human's milk. I get, I can kind of see that one, but uh, we don't, we don't inject milk through, through the IV anymore. Well, we do. Yeah. I tell people when we, when I give propofol that it's just milk. That is true. Propofol. Now I can tell them that they started doing this in 1847. Well, you should, you should definitely spread that around. Well, I tell mm-hmm. That basically, what happened there, Mike, is uh, you were incorrect again. So the Lancaster Medical Heritage Museum will be awarded an eponym. And so I don't know, Mike, if you heard of Lancaster units? I have not, no. Hmm. Well, this is a totally real measurement unit. I, I I'll tell you that. It does measure a quantity of medical history-related social media posts, uh, the standard of which might have been set by the Lancaster Medical Heritage Museum themselves, thanks to, seems like, an endless well of creativity that they always have because they're always posting so many things. And we, by comparison, uh, post on social media in amounts approximately equal to 0.3 Lancaster units. Uh, And (laughs) that's because we have a lot of work to do. But uh, that being said, they are my heroes on there. Someday we will be as cool as they are, but uh, we invite everybody to go check them out. Uh, Check out the links Links we'll put down on the show notes. Follow them. uh, A lot of fun. So again, hello, Kim. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Kim. And Mike, you failed. Thanks for making me look like an idiot, Kim. (laughs) Well, how hard is that, really? It's not. If you, dear listener, would like to send a trivia question for Mike to fail at and get your own medical eponym, you can do so through messaging us on the social media pages, through our website, or by emailing us at historianspod at gmail.com. And so, well, let's get on with it. 
Now, as we mentioned in the intro this week, we are fortunate to be joined by another esteemed guest on the show. So coming to us from the world of medical history authorship with his newest book, The Masters of Medicine, is best-selling author Dr. Andrew Lamb. Aside from a collection of literary awards, Dr. Lamb happens to be a retinal surgeon. And Mike, that's I, I looked it up. That is the back part of the eye. Like, yeah, not, not I just, the part you see. I just ultrasounded a retina the other day. It was fine, I think. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Uh, he is a retinal surgeon at Bay State Medical Center. And uh, this book is the fourth that he has published and is a collection of stories about the most innovative and important medical advances that have been made to date. Uh, and so today we're going to discuss one of those chapters, uh, the one involving is in- entitled Heart Disease, The Mavericks, to get kind of an overview of how we, we went through all the steps of discovering how to do the most advanced and present uh, cardiac care and kind of the people that were involved in that. And so uh, with that, all of that introduction, uh, I want to welcome you to the show, Dr. Lamb. Thanks a lot for having me. This was a very enjoyable uh, series of stories to read, especially because, you know, like we always in the emergency department take this a little bit for granted. I, I At least I know we do. Like how many people might come in, you're diagnosed, you're diagnosed with a heart attack. Uh, you know that they need to get to a cath lab. Things happen, you just shout things, and then all the medicines are given, and within like 15 minutes, they disappear down a hallway uh, where they are being saved by a cardiologist on the interventional table, and it it is almost so routine. It is certainly heroic, but it is so routine that I, I never really stopped to think about how many steps went into... Isn't it awesome when that happens? You see the patient just leaving, and then you don't have to worry about them anymore? That's what ophthalmologists think. <laughs> <laughs> it's what it wait what is the ophthalmology uh, cath lab case <laughs> oh, good question ah the only you know as a retina surgeon we're trying to fix retinal detachments but even that is not as urgent as uh you know a cardiac cath is necessary to you know when you're having an mi so a, a heart attack so sure don't, yeah maybe an intraocular foreign body even that is not as urgent as a heart attack <laughs> <laughs> that's fair well i will tell you i i think every emergency physician we feel great when we see a disposition happening and a patient going mm-hmm. to the place they need to go to to get the care. And once they're out of the emergency department means we feel good every time that happens. So it, even better when they're going to go have their life saved. You know, that, that does feel good. So there are so many things that went into figuring out how to do what I'm describing. We're going to kind of go through some of that stuff. But, you know, one of the interesting things that kind of comes up early in this chapter that uh, we that covers all this subject is the fact that, you know, up until the really the like 19th century or late 19th century, early, maybe earliest 20th century, they weren't in medicine all that focused on the heart like we are today, right? It was sort of uh, one of these organs that we knew was important, you know, but it wasn't, uh, I, I believe in the book, it wasn't until about 1912 that an internist named James Hork even speculated that like to a congregation of physicians that, uh, hey, those arteries that give the heart muscle its blood flow are probably pretty important and maybe related to when people seem to become deceased immediately yeah. or are dropping <laughs> dead at that time. And because there just doesn't seem to be like there was a lot of thought about this. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. why, how was this organ put so far behind the other ones at this point in time? You know, you got, at, the, at the turn of the, night of the 20th century, the average lifespan was maybe 47, late 40s. So people weren't really dying from heart attacks like they were in the 20th century. Uh, they were mostly dying from infections, right? So people weren't really living long enough to get coronary artery disease as, as prevalent as it is today. So there would be people in their you know middle age who would just suddenly clutch their chest and collapse and die. Certainly mm-hmm. that was very mysterious to people. People didn't really know what was going on. You can imagine what that would have been like. You don't really understand what's going on inside the heart. The heart is kind of uh, mysterious. You can't examine it. You can't you know, operate on it. It's hidden in the center of the chest behind a wall of ribs, right? And I think mm-hmm. that doctors kind of got an idea from autopsies and, and dissections that these coronary arteries are important, but they didn't really understand how uh, heart attacks occurred. And this guy, James Herrick, was one of, he's credited with basically being the first to really explain the clinical syndrome and essentially say there's something called thrombosis or kind of a blood clot that forms in a coronary artery. And if you block it, then the heart muscle is not getting enough uh, nourishment. You can die, but you can also survive. And maybe there's something we can do about this mm-hmm. in the future, you know? 
you guys see it all the time, obviously, in the ER. Oh, absolutely. And we see, like, a lot of times in the ER, we deal with uh, both of those scenarios. So one is uh, a clot or, a, you know, the inner lining of the artery, the, the coronary artery, that's the one that gives the heart muscle its blood flow. It can become narrowed over time. It gets the walls of the artery get filled with like a fatty calcium substance, what we call plaque. And sometimes that plaque can break. And if it breaks, mm -hmm. it then can like form a clot right there. And so what this looks like in real life is a person coming in usually with pretty sudden chest pain, or they've had some chest discomfort that may be painful, may not be painful. That's a whole other bag of worms there. But they come mm -hmm. in um, with enough symptoms to raise our concern. You do an EKG where you look at the electrical tracing of their heart. And in one case, you can actually see, oh, something's probably blocked. And uh, that's the person who we want to take uh, in, and introduce very quickly to our cardiology colleagues who can then go in and open that narrowing, give the heart muscle its blood flow back. But there are other mm -hmm. folks, as you said, that they might have narrowing in like a couple of different, there's three main coronary arteries. So like they may have narrowings in three different arteries and kind of over time, sort of the pipes are getting a little bit more blocked in different areas. And so they might not have classic stories or their EKG doesn't tell us uh, that electrical tracing does not tell us there's a blockage obviously right now. And so you have to like kind of measure some stuff in the blood, go by the story, try to figure out what, uh, what you think is most likely happening and then have a conversation, kind of a risk and benefit, maybe admit them to the hospital, et cetera. Uh, I miss anything, Mike? Nope. Excellent. I'm just trying to see, did James Horick ever have an eponym or something like a device named after him? Good question. He, not that I know of, but he's, he's credited with uh, the first guy to d identify sickle cell disease actually as well. So this guy was oh, pretty wow. smart. Oh, dude. interesting. Yeah. yeah. We haven't covered that one on the show yet. We definitely will in the future, but you know, so yeah, in these, these folks, uh, I remember a very early episode, boy, it might even be like episode one, two or three. I found some journal article about a autopsy that was done in like the, I think the early 19th century where somebody had, you could read this, this um, pathology report and say like, oh, this person definitely had cardiac symptoms. And when they did a dissection, they found like basically what was scarred heart tissue, but they had no idea that it was related to the coronary arteries because they just weren't getting blood flow to that area. So this, yeah, this was a, this was not an area that also you could like, as you mentioned, you can't open it up and look at it at least right. in this time and say oh you know okay that that artery looks a little uh, crunchy or black let's uh, do something about it this was all speculative and that's right and a lot of people didn't believe them frankly like e even in the 20th century people were debating whether thrombosis was the cause of a heart attack or just an incidental finding you know so like people's mm -hmm. they thought people's myocardium would die and then a thrombosis would occur afterwards you know so it, it was going in well into the 20th century before people really ad adopted this theory and I think uh, it was in like 1918 or so when they actually coined the term. So the, we say heart attack in kind of general, you know, when we're, a lot of folks, when they say heart attack, what medically we refer to, it's a myocardial infarction. It just means like heart muscle dies because there is no blood flow to it. And so mm -hmm. they didn't even have a term for that until 1918, which is kind of incredible, you know. But that like puts us a little bit ahead to, you know, okay, so there we're starting to come up with what is this diagnosis? And then... So 1929, we've got a, a German physician, which I'm going to guess mm -hmm. is pronounced uh, Dr. Werner Forsman, yeah, who yeah. then starts playing around with some catheters. And can you tell us a little bit about that story? It's, uh, uh, this is a fantastic story. Uh, so story. basically, picture this 24-year-old this German intern, and he gets this idea in his you know, suburban hospital in Germany to stick a catheter in his a vessel in his arm and see if can, can you describe what that is just somebody may not know like when you say catheter oh yeah sorry a catheter like what i mean by catheter is just a very small tube like a little plastic tube and um in, in this day and age like in the 20s they would maybe use it as a ureteral catheter like to drain the bladder or something like that and he had read a, an article about it being done in a horse so he thought oh there's no reason anatomically i can't do this and so he went to his senior doctor and he said can I do this? And the guy said, absolutely not, because the conventional wisdom was, of course, makes sense. You put something foreign in the heart, it's going to cause an arrhythmia. And then oh, you were die. talking about the heart, like catheter in the in the blood vessel, not the horse urethra. <laughs> no, no, just checking. Yeah. Not not this time. I mean, sometimes <laughs> around the dinner, dinner table, I'm talking about that other thing you mentioned, because veterinary care is very important. Of course, <laughs> they teach us a lot about that in medical school, which is very wise. So. <laughs> 
the guy, the doc, the student goes, the intern goes, no problem. That's totally unethical. I totally get it. I can't do it on a patient. Never been done before. So then he says, I have a solution. I'll do it to myself. And the, the attending is basically like, that. that's ridiculous, <laughs> right? You're going to commit suicide. I'm not going to let you do it. I forbid it. So this guy, Werner Forsman, realizes he's not going to get official permission for this. So he kind of hatches this secret plot. He dupes this nurse into giving him the supplies. He, you can picture him essentially n- uh, numbing his, his uh, elbow and putting his catheter in and walking down to the x-ray suite in the bottom of his hospital, in the basement of his hospital. And along the way, like a friend sees him and thinks he's going to mm-hmm. commit suicide. He's literally grabbing for the end of the catheter and Forsman has to like push him away, kick him in the shins to get him out of the way. He shoots an x-ray, the tip of the catheter is at the head of the humerus at the left shoulder. He advances it maybe a foot, foot and a half. The next shot. It's in the right side of the heart. And he's not dead. And everyone's just amazed, right? right? <laughs> and so this guy proves that he, you could do it and not die, which becomes one of the greatest you know, advances in the 20th century, cardiac Well, I love that you have that x-ray in your book. I just remember mm. I looked at it because it looks like the exact x-ray we would have today after we put in what's called a central line. You know, when we, ER docs and like intensivists will put in a, a, a catheter, a tube in whether it's the arm or a big neck, vein or you know whatnot you, you want to snake it and see it on the x-ray go right to where the right side of the heart begins i remember looking at it, i was looking at the picture in the book and i was going hey nailed it like perfect position i uh, got it the first try i don't know i, I don't know if he had sterile technique per se i was like just gonna say that he died of sepsis <laughs> <laughs> line infection he got lucky he survived but, you know I, I respect the fact that he he's like you know what I'll just do it on myself. Like that's um Yeah, that is that was nuts. I am not that brave. I'm just gonna tell you right now, not not Mm-mm. not that brave. But nope. it it was um it's it's a pretty cool story. The other part is when I was reading your book, I started getting a little I was getting a little worried because he it actually to get the nurse to let him do mm-hmm. it, because she had to get him the supplies, doesn't he trick her into yeah. basically being restrained yeah. on a procedure table? Cause she offered to let him do the she, procedure on her. Yeah, I was so like, this oh no. This nurse had the key to the supplies that he needed. And he basically kind of, she, he, people kind of, I think, knew that he wasn't really supposed to do this because the doctor had said, don't do this. But he basically beguiled her. And I think she became somewhat infatuated with him to the point where she volunteered to be his subject. You know, he, she didn't want, she didn't want to do it, him to do it on himself, but she volunteered because it was going to help medical science. So she, mm-hmm. there was this whole big production where she, he basically says, okay, I'll do it to you. Ties her down on this. This is going to be a great documentary or movie someday onto this uh, operating table. But secretly, he's basically getting ready to do it on himself, essentially. Mm-hmm. So, so. It's, it's just one, his autobiography is very dramatic. He later becomes okay. a Nazi. He's in World War II. There's a lot of other drama. He wins the Nobel Prize. It's a great one. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of them yeah, I was looking that. at the time I was like ooh it's my turn ex-Nazi. he becomes an ex-Nazi <laughs> not, not all our heroes are, are perfect clearly <laughs> no we, we have learned that over and over again during this show yeah but that was like one of those I'm reading it going oh no this is going to take a really dark turn okay no he just he yeah. just you know basically he's, it, so that she couldn't stop him he's like okay and now I'm going to do it to myself exactly. so that that's good so alright he basically settles the issue of I can take this little flexible tube and I can put it into a blood vessel in my arm, a vein in this case, and I can snake it all the way up to my heart and nothing bad happens, which you know, it's step one. It, it is right. definitely step one. But his idea, I mean, and the idea that he was doing this for is really, can we use a catheter to look at the heart while it's kind of functioning, right? And it, um, for, I don't want to misremember it, but w- did they have IV dye at that time? Could they? Could, was he hoping to basically squirt dye into the right side of the heart so it would yeah. light up the the arteries eventually? I, I, I good question. I think his in, one of his initial, you know, very sophomoric ideas was just maybe we can just insert like medicines directly at the heart, like a really good Fair. IV, basically right into the heart. But you know, certainly I think that imaging dyes w- was uh, something he thought of as well. And the, the guy, the people who made the next discovery wasn't for another 30 years. And it's a really great story of serendipity where this guy, Mason Soans at the Cleveland Clinic does this accidental thing that helps us realize that maybe we can look at the coronary arteries, you know? Fast forward to what, 1958, right? Yeah, that's right. As you said, Cleveland Clinic. In The way I read it was, uh, you know, Dr. Mason Soans is like, all right, yeah, anybody could 
put a catheter into the venous system. I want to go into the arteries of uh, the arterial yeah. system because that's really more direct to the arteries that will give the heart its blood flow. And uh, his first attempt at doing this, would you say it went swimmingly or not so swimmingly? <laughs> it wasn't an attempt to do this, actually. Everybody thought that if you put something in a tiny coronary artery, you would cause an immediate heart attack and kill the patient, either from occlusion of the artery, just from the catheter itself, sure. or if you were to inject an imaging dye, that's not blood and that's not going to nourish the heart. It's going to kill the patient, right? So this whole idea was just a total accident. So picture this, he's, he's doing an aortogram. So there's a ton of blood coming out of the heart through the aorta. And so to get enough imaging dye... And that's just... Uh, sorry, I'm going to back up real quick. It. That's the sure. giant blood vessel coming out of the heart. So that's like right. the, 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 the... All the blood coming out of the heart basically comes right through the aorta, right in the middle of your right. chest. And so he's and trying to get this catheter the there. Yeah, he's trying to get, get a catheter. And he has to... It, it goes so fast. The blood flow is moving so fast. You have to do what's called a power injection, where there's literally a machine that plunges like 30 cc's of dye right into the aorta. So they can maybe get a quick glimpse of what the aorta looks like, I guess. And sure. when you do this, there's so much fluid going through the catheter that the tip of it flicks around like a fire hose, right? And <laughs> right when he gives the order to fire, he sees the tip lodge into one of the coronary arteries. And he says, stop, but it's too late. And this huge bolus of dye goes into one of the coronary arteries. And so the patient, you know, this is obviously going to kill the patient, everyone's thinking. And the patient's heart actually stops. And so sure. at this point, sure. he's like, okay, we're really in trouble. He's looking around for a scalpel to open the chest, literally, because they didn't have external defibrillation. They only had paddles that you could apply to the heart directly. And he's telling the patient to cough because he's thinking maybe if he exerts pressure in the chest, like it'll help push the dye through faster. And he's about to cut the guy's chest open and the patient like comes back. The heart, the heart comes out of his sicily and comes back. And he realizes that first of all, he basically almost killed a guy, which is bad. Right. It's a moment of reflection you should have. <laughs> That's yes. right. You, most people, but a lot of these guys in this cardiology story are just so, so supremely arrogant that they don't even consider that <laughs> humility. They basically just said, <laughs> well, what can I do next? Right. And he goes, I realize if I, first of all, he didn't die. So it's possible to inject dye in the coronary arteries and not kill the patient. And so we like can a actually, lot of it at once. Yeah, you could do that. You can image the coronary arteries in life for the first time, which of course led to tons of great information about how heart attacks occur. But what if I gave less? What if I diluted it, right? Pretty hmm. basic. And so he, that's, that was a huge breakthrough. Coronary angiography was basically birthed on that day on accident. That's the step of, okay, now we can... Squirt some dye into the arteries, not that much, but a little bit. See what they look yeah. like, see where they're narrow, see if they're blocked, et cetera. Because before this, you know, especially, and you point out nicely in your book, like before 1960, mortality, if you were having, you come present to the ER with a heart attack, or whatever, even if it wasn't an ER they back then, but yeah, yeah you, you, your mortality was 30 to 40%. Uh, and I mean, the standard of yeah, care yeah. then was like, you give some aspirin, you give some morphine, you give some nitroglycerin, a lot of that we still do, don't get me wrong, but you mm. gave thrombolytics, which was just a drug that basically would dissolve blood clots everywhere. And it did, it can work in the right condition, but it's sort of like a big shotgun blast. Whereas this was the first step to say, hey, let's find the artery that is the problem and then maybe sometime down the future, we can fix just that artery as opposed to making the patient extremely bleedy, uh, just <laughs> hoping that we get get some clots out of the way because you know, it may not always be a clot uh, is the problem. In this day and age, what when you guys are taking care of patients, what's your impression of like how, what's the mortality of people who come to you guys with to your, to your emergency room and, with, and with heart attacks? How many of them are dying or are most of them surviving? The vast it majority. all depends on their state before they come in. I would say mm -hmm. if if they're alive and talking, go to the cath lab. I'd, I don't know. It feels like less than one percent. It feels really low. Yeah, I don't have an official number, but I agree with you. I mean, I've had uh, my fair share of extremely scary cases with people who are crazy mm -hmm. sick at the time they arrive, and even you know most of those have done okay. And that's like Amazing. a patient who's in bad state beforehand. So, mm -hmm. you know, it is I, at some point I can look up the number, but it is it is way better than thirty to forty percent. You oh, know, yeah, of, yeah, of people, it's insanely better. And, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, in some places, if you don't have 
a cardiologist that is able to do these procedures because not every place has them. If you're out in the middle of nowhere, you're in a very rural setting, giving these blood thinners, you know, within a certain period of time is still the best we can do, you know, but we'll, uh, you know, now though we get to the point where in this story, we can put catheters into arteries and especially to the coronary arteries. We can then squirt those. We can see if there's a blockage, like a blood clot, or we can see if it's really narrow, you know, with plaque and stuff like that. And I, I this is like a perfect time. I just want to say, can you explain the verb doddering? Because uh, I don't think, I don't know if it was supposed to, but I did. <laughs> It did make me a laugh great, when I a great verb. <laughs> so it's named after a, a guy. His name was Charles Dodder. <laughs> I, yeah. So it, this guy was a flamboyant like radiologist in at the University of Oregon, and he kind of made the next advance. You know, we're kind of marching towards this modern day situation where amazing interventional cardiologists can go in and open up coronary arteries and save people when they're having a heart attack. So the next advance was this radiologist who accidentally another serendipitous thing was like was basically doing a catheterization in an iliac artery which is a leg artery and yeah. basically accidentally pushed his catheter through a blood clot and found that he had basically reestablished flow by just pushing it out of the way or jamming it down and breaking <laughs> it up and and that basically he from this like accident he came up with this idea of using intelis like incre like catheters of slowly of gradually increasing diameter one after another to basically open up pathways in in occluded arteries and it was basically nicknamed doddering because he would do this <laughs> it's pretty basic you know uh, you know it's and, it's not exactly rocket science well he was also kind of like uh what was the story about him with the arrogance he did um yeah was he the one that things. gave the presentation Okay. Yeah, he yeah he he was giving a presentation once, and he's like, "I've been talking to you for twenty minutes, and this whole time I've had a catheter in my heart." <laughs> so he like shows <laughs> people his arm, and he brings it in on an oscilloscope, and he's like, "Look, if I go into the different chambers of the heart, the waveform looks like this and that." And then there was another famous story that he loved to tell, uh, where surgeons would get very ticked off at him because they would need his help to image the arteries are going to do surgery on, but sometimes he would just fix it just by jamming his catheters through. So one time uh, a surgeon <laughs> said, visualize, but do not fix because they didn't want to fix it. So of course he ignores their advice and he fixes it anyway. And then he takes this patient up to like the top of Mount Hood with a film crew to, uh, with a <laughs> movie camera to, to, to basically show how healthy the patient is after his procedure. So that's Charles daughter and daughtering. And I, yeah, and like doddering is just what I guess what being like so headstrong in your procedure just to do it and uh, and whatnot. But he, the thing is, like, he would have there might be a blockage and he could like push the catheter and you know, like kind of a flexible but maybe firm enough tube through it. But that's not the best way. No, because <laughs> there were plenty of problems. <laughs> yeah, you can send a shower of asteroids down the <laughs> down the yeah. tube and like cause you know infarction further down. So it wasn't exactly perfect. At so all. do you like, uh, and I think, um, I think you mentioned it in the book, but like if you are, um, if you were to push through like a, um, uh, a, like an artery in the, the neck and you push through the plaque, it's possible mm. you can send the asteroids strokes, of clots, yeah, you know, showers of clots mm. into the brain and cause strokes and stuff. So, I mean, you do restore blood flow. You won't always cause showers of clots. But there, 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 as they say on me, you know, as seen TV, uh, there has to be a better way. And I think the yeah. next part of the story is balloons. Balloons yeah, are who important. Thought, right? This, this, the guy who in, to developed balloons, balloon angi angioplasty, and later, you know, we play stents using this technique. Uh, it's, you know, saved millions of lives around the world. Uh, and another, it's a, he's a guy who was a true maverick, a, a, a guy named Andreas Grunzig, who basically was an East German doctor who got this crazy idea you know he he had seen a presentation of what charles daughter's technique and he said i think i can think of a better way what if we put a balloon on the tip of a catheter and inflated it inside an artery to, to widen the space and recanalize or open up mm -hmm. the artery again right i mean it, it's kind of like what an, like it, what an eighth grader might come up with this give presented with this problem and think of like oh well we could do that in a brainstorming session right but he's sure, literally sure. devoted his life, you know, many his years to figuring this out. You know, he's like trying to glue a cath a balloon onto the end of a catheter using thread, and you know, he's talking to like 
junior high school mm -hmm. like chemistry professors to figure something out long story short he actually does it you know but he, he basically is able to find a plastic that's firm enough that it will expand equally along its length and not just kind of like blue like bend and like a so you don't have like a dumbbell shape around the stenosis or around the occlusion yeah like you're great like a balloon animal uh, yeah. you, know, you squeeze the long part of it and it like exactly. kind of balloons both sides but it doesn't yeah yeah it, that, it's exactly not easy uh, to do right like this. You, yeah this is like there's so many challenges you've got to get the catheter up into a coronary artery you got to like get something that actually opens it you know you don't know if you're going to make it worse and you know long story short he basically accomplishes this in the 70s he first does it in like a leg artery. It's amazing. He goes, great part of the story is he goes to the American Heart Association meeting. And, you know, he's just a European guy who nobody knows at this meeting and nobody pays attention to his presentation. Plays really. with he's balloons. got a poster, he gives a presentation. <laughs> exactly. And then, but there's this one American guy who believes that it might do something. So this guy uh, named Myler, Richard Myler, invites him to San Francisco to try it in a human for the first time during uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. So it's kind of like a very controlled environment and it works in this surgical patient. And then finally he goes back to Germany and now it's basically, you know, like 1977 and he does it for the first time in a coronary artery of a patient and it works. And it, it's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, he, he's literally outside the patient. He's making, there's no cuts into the sternum or the chest. Uh, he's snaking the catheter. He's, Wait, he, is the chest open at the from time? The leg, from no. the groin, basically? Yeah, from the groin. No, so the first one he did, Mike, was on an open heart patient. So, like, mm -hmm. they were doing the open heart surgery. The chest is open. Mm -hmm. They do it on that one is my understanding. Because, yeah, you know, something goes wrong. I guess you, you can be right yeah. there to surgically do something. Mm -hmm. So this was the time they didn't do it. And he said, I think I can get this catheter up into that artery. And I can use my fancy balloon to, like, open it up in a safer way. Because if you expand the balloon inside the blockage, it's less likely that you're going to send stuff flying downstream. It just sort of presses on all the walls equally to smush it out of the way. And, uh, and so, yeah, he's in the, the, um, the, the way that you described it is that, you know, he's, he's in there, he does the procedure and it sounds like everybody in that room was like, mm -hmm. wow, we just and, saw uh, something. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you could actually see it happening before your eyes on the fluoroscope and the blood flow is yeah. just, so he can see you know, the artery, no flow. Great. He yes. pumps up the balloon. Now the artery has flow and the patient is awake and says, Hey, my chest pain's yeah. better bonus. Yeah. And you know, next, so exactly. And he brings his his movies of his procedure to the next year's American Heart Association, and he gets a, people basically realize they're seeing medical history being made, and that he gets a standing ovation, which never happens at our meetings. So most of the meetings we go to, or no. you know, the doctors are spored, they're sleeping, you know, and this yep. is incredible. Yep. I got a cool trick for that, though. So I once had to give uh, my emergency medicine group a uh, actually it was a cardiac uh, echo, like a bedside echocardiography. Um, mm. presentation. Mike, were you there for that one? I'm curious. I don't remember if you were. Probably. Uh, I don't know. I think I was sleeping. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> um, so I, you know, we, we, wow. we do our like journal club. So we like, let's learn something new. And I was, uh, I, I, I was pretty good with ultrasound. I did the uh, mm. presentation on like, you know, findings on a heart echocardiogram at the bedside. And, and so wow. to make sure that nobody was falling asleep, I went ahead and, you know, it's important. You need to relate images to to things that sticks in memory. So uh, I found as many wrestling related references as I could put into a uh, cardiac echocardiog echocardiography uh, lecture for emergency physicians and uh, used a bunch of wrestling imagery to uh, simulate like wall motion. So if a heart was very hyperdynamic, beating really hard, I had this video of like the ultimate warrior, you know, grabbing the ring ropes, nice. and being ultimate warrior like, um, and the, like for the 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 right ventricle wall. Let's say you have a situation we're going to talk about a little bit called tamponade, where you have too much pressure outside the heart and it can't expand, and it kind of makes this wormy, wiggly shape. Uh, there's a wrestler called Scotty Tuhati, who that was his finisher, the worm. And so uh, I had these amazing videos, and at least four people out of probably eighteen paid attention. And that's they said I don't remember anything about what you were talking about other than the wrestling. So I succeeded in some ways, um, in the ways that were important to me. I don't remember anything about it at all. Yeah. Not even the wrestling. That's great. Your students were very lucky to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Most I people don't put that. any of that out of that effort into uh, their lectures. See, and, and Mike didn't even appreciate it. Mm -mm. I don't think you were there, to be honest. I, I don't think I was either. Hmm. 
got we brought all the catheters the the non-invasive cardiology we got up to like 1977 when when all these events are happening but before that there was sort of another pathway right and we kind of mentioned it open heart surgery doing surgery on a heart that is moving and pumping and you know not as easy as it sounds uh because it's moving (laughs) and so at the time that they were doing the non-invasive stuff, you know, I think your story here begins in like the late uh, 1896 or so with yeah. a surgeon who was the first to kind of like try to sew the heart, you know? So this, can you take yeah. us through that story a little bit? Yeah. So if you think about it for millennia, right, the heart was inviolate. You couldn't touch it. You couldn't operate on it. You know, it's, it's moving constantly. It's buried in the center of the chest behind a wall of ribs. And only in the most desperate situations would anyone even consider trying to touch it, essentially. So the first time someone actually sewed a full thickness heart wound was by this guy named Ludwig Ren, R-E-N, R-E-H-N, who was in Germany in 1896. There was a guy who had been kind of in a bar brawl, and he'd been stabbed with a stiletto. And someone found him mm. in a park. Whoa. Like the heel? And he, or the knife? Maybe under a bench or something. I don't know. <laughs> so they brought him to this hospital and the guy was languishing, but he wasn't dead. And they were, he was really lucky because this, this expert surgeon was there and he realized this guy was, something was wrong. And he had a very astute uh, knowledge of anatomy. And he had this theory, maybe there was blood collecting in the pericardial space that was compressing the heart. And that's why this guy who was alive, not totally dead yet, but was really suffering. Maybe that's what was happening. So he, he decided to operate and he does the operation. He opens the chest, spreads the ribs, sees the pericardial sac, makes a little slit and all this blood gushes out. He was right. He made the right diagnosis. And then mm. he looks in and sees a little incision in the heart. And he realizes, you know, what's he going to do? He's not going to give up. He's going to try to sew it. Because it's still bleeding, right? It's still oozing. It's the right side of the heart, thank God, because if it was the left side of the heart, it would have been game over, I'm sure, because the right side of the heart has just lower pressure. And he's never seen a heart beating like this in life. And he's he he writes later, you know, during systole when it's contracted, it's as hard as a stone. And it's it actually the incision goes under the sternum. He can't even see it. So he can only see it during diastole when the heart's relaxed, and he has to time it. (laughs) So that he can see it and the heart's at its most full full extent so that it's not going to, he's not going to put a suture and then it's going to fill up and the suture is going to, you know, break. So he manages to sew this heart and it's the first time. But of course, this is like a parlor trick, you know, no one's ever going to be able to plan a heart surgery like this because, sure. <laughs> you know, who's going to come in with a stiletto wound to the right side of the heart only and just be waiting for the cardiac surgeon? So it sure. really wasn't this idea before the advent of the heart lung machine, which allows us today to still the heart and perform proper operations. It's still just kind of a lucky, serendipitous, you know, one off. So right, the right patient with the right wound, with the right, the right surgeon, with the right doctor, right? Yep. Total luck. And and I like, I, you know, I I can only imagine the you know timing is really important in video games. You know, you got to time the jump, time the you know whatnot. Mm-hmm. Timing sewing a beating heart is that's pretty incredible. That's some good stuff. Yeah, it's hard enough yeah, to sew like easy. a oh, like a squiggly kid. <laughs> I didn't imagine <laughs> yeah. doing that. It is equally as difficult to be honest. Uh, Probably yeah. harder. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I don't know it, how especially you guys do that. a two year old. A two year old is exactly as strong as like a adolescent rhinoceros. <laughs> they don't want to be sewed. So, yeah, it takes. Uh, you have to find equally uh, brute forced like nursing staff to help out. And, uh, and then when that fails, you, you do sedation. That's too, that's too young for fall patrol to kind of be an opiate either. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's the rare, it's the same thing. It's the rare child that is easy to <laughs> sew in those circumstances. Uh, but well, you know, so there, there, there's that, there's the trauma side of things. And there's like these other accounts that you bring up of like, uh, you mm-hmm. know, World War II where they had shrapnel injuries to the yeah. heart and there's like pieces of shrapnel. And that's where they start to kind of do some, different sewing techniques but again that's all very yeah. that's sort right. of um piecemeal stuff i think the interesting thing because we don't see a lot of it today uh was the story of doctors harkin and bailey who yeah, go in and they try to figure yeah they they're, tell us a little bit like they're they're trying to uh do surgery on a valve right. problem so i guess what let's start with kind of what are the valves and why were they yeah. an issue back then that we don't see as much today 
Well, so in the mid 20th century and prior to that, there was a big, a common cardiac problem was called mitral stenosis. The mitral valve separates the left atrium and the left ventricle. So its job is to allow the blood to pass through and then slam shut so that the left ventricle, when it contracts, it ejects the blood out the aorta. It does not go backwards into the left atrium, of course. And this is, again, before the heart-lung machine. So this was this mitral stenosis often came from kids who had had rheumatic fever when they were kids. You know, in this mm-hmm. um, in, in this era infection. before antibiotics, people would get rheumatic fever. Like a kid would get sick, he'd recover fine. But then the inflammation from the infection would gradually cause uh, scarring of the heart valves, and you'd get like thickening, and the heart valve wouldn't open and close properly. And then this became a big problem when they become young adults in the prime of their lives, in their twenties and their thirties. And they would basically, a lot of them would die. And so certain surgeons, a couple surgeons, Dwight Harkin and Charles Bailey, were these supremely confident, arrogant surgeons who wanted <laughs> to, to do something way. about it, you know? And Harkin is a great guy. You know, one of my favorite adages is the only winner in war is medicine. It's so true, right? You know, mm-hmm. and, and, and necessity is the mother of invention. So Harkin had been a surgeon in World War II. They both had been in World War II, but Harkin had encountered these patients. He was a surgeon outside of London, an army hospital. And he would sometimes get these soldiers with terrible chest wounds. And these men would have shrapnel and pieces of metal in their heart that had penetrated their heart, but the metal was still lodged in place. Mm -hmm. So the patients weren't dead, but they had pieces of metal in their heart walls and they were, they were languishing. They were going to die either from exsanguination or from Mm -hmm. blood clots forming on metal surfaces or from arrhythmias. And so we wanted to try to think of some way to, to do something about this, but he knew the minute he pulled out a piece of metal, what was going to happen? Geyser of blood, right? It's going to mm-hmm. be, he's going to find himself with the heart is obscured in a pool of blood. He can't see what he's doing and he's going to lose the patient in minutes. So he comes up with this brilliant technological advance. He wants to put his, he decides, I'm going to put my finger in the heart right after I pull the metal out. He's yep. going to do a finger in the dike strategy, you know? Okay. So it's yep. not that brilliant, but he actually does it and it works. He puts the finger in the heart in one of these patients and it gives him enough time to suture closed the uh, the wound. And then he does it. He comes up with his other idea. What if I put a per, pre-placed, a purse string of suture around it before I take the metal out? And then I can just, instead of like having to put the sutures one by one, I can just pull it shut. Yeah. Brilliant, take right? Take your finger out and whoosh, cinch exactly. it down. And so this, this had worked. He, he took the metal out of multiple soldiers' hearts uh, during the war. And so it gave these, these two surgeons this idea. So in mitral valve, the mitral valve separates, as I said, the atrium and the ventral on the left side of the heart. So the idea was, what if we pre-placed a ring of suture in the left atrium above the mitral valve, made an intentional incision in the middle of the ring, stuck my finger in, and then what can I do with a finger in the heart? You root well, around. You can poke, right? You can just poke <laughs> it around. You can poke it through the mitral valve orifice that is narrowed and scarred, and hopefully open it up to make it more functional, right? Poke around carefully, but yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm sure this is other surgeons have done this, you know, in different specialties. But again, this is, again, the first premeditated attempts to operate on a heart in the kind of planned way. And so Bailey tries this um, in Philadelphia. He kills a patient and then he, another patient, the second patient, you know, in the first patient, Bailey's sutures for the ring suture, he t- pulls it tight and the, the suture pulls out. Yeah. And the guy just exsanguinates in minutes. The second patient survives the surgery but dies within two days. The third patient, he accidentally pushes too hard and breaks the mitral valve and he converts yeah. mitral stenosis to mitral insufficiency. There's like no mitral valve now and the right. patient dies too. And so, the, so all that blood just goes from the left ventricle back up the atrium and exactly. into the lungs. And, yeah. and he's losing his operating privileges as he's with failure after failure. And he he's almost ready to give up. And his, he has operating privileges at two hospitals in Philadelphia. And he decides, like, if he fails one more time, they're going to take, he's going to be finished. So he's like, to, to increase my chance of success, I'm going to schedule two operations on the same day, one in the morning at Philadelphia <laughs> General and one in the afternoon at Episcopal, so that even if my first patient dies, I can jet across town and start the second operation, get my second try before someone tries to stop me. I mean, I don't think you guys operate in any hospital that's any, you don't know any doctors who, who like try to do this. This is ridiculous. It is so, insane. It is hubris. insane. And the guy's first patient dies. So he's driving over to Episcopal Hospital and he does a surgery on this woman named Constance Warner, who's like this young 20 some year old 
woman who can't function, can't, she can't take care of her kids, her heart failure is so yeah. bad. And it, it basically works. And this patient lives into her 60s. And true to form, he's shouting from the rooftops. His, his reputation, which was, was very bad, people called him the butcher behind his back. It, it was instantly restored. Why? He took her on a train ride to Chicago, a thousand mile train ride to parade her in front of a meeting. Like, I'm the greatest. Look at this thing that I did. Here's the patient. And uh, it's just an incredible story. And Harkin also was able to do this, but they killed a lot of patients on the way to well, success. That's, like you're reading this, and what was there? Was, like two people survived in twelve cases. Yeah, I mean, was that, six, did I remember like, that? Correct? Six days after Bailey's first successful case, Harkin had his first successful case. But before that, he tried it on six people; they'd all died. So at that yeah. point, the worldwide success rate was like two out of twelve. And as grim as that sounds there was no alternative right so there this was yeah. if once the mitral valve was becoming more and more scarred and then beca- basically closing off there was no other treatment at that time it was you just you you the choice was to die of heart failure by suffocating right. with blood in your lungs or right. this heroic procedure which i uh, didn't have great odds but it was not no odds and so you know it i think it's important to kind of put those things in reference you know like these mm-hmm. I don't know if I can excuse I'm going to do two on one day because that way they won't catch me in time <laughs> yes. uh, to do it again. I mean, yeah. he was right eventually. But then again, the flip side of that is that there just really wasn't another option. Well, have you guys ever done anything in the ER be- and there was nobody else around to do it? You just had to do it because the patient was going to die. Thoracotomy, mm, yeah. anything like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I we're trained on a lot of those procedures. I don't, and plenty of them... You know, like I have been part of like a couple of tra- or, uh, um, mm. cricothyrotomies where you've yeah. got to put a uh, airway into the, the, the windpipe, you know, from outside. Yes. So that's kind of a, you know, if there's nobody around. Did you use a pen? Like take out the pen and use <laughs> uh, a hollow Anaconda style? Pen. Yeah. And then, <laughs> then the surgeon got all mad at me and said, it's not what a, a good movie, so don't it's... do that. <laughs> it's too bad Aaron's not here. Aaron's done all the cool stuff. Yeah. So uh, our, our co-host and partner, Aaron, um, he is the proverbial as we say in the emergency department black cloud like the people who uh-huh. the worst things that come through the door will always happen to aaron i mean i think always he's he's he's, he's open um, a chest i think he's yeah. the only one in our Whoa. group that's open a chest we're in a community hospital too and he yeah yeah so if, yeah. if and uh and, but he, he does it you yeah. know because because we're trained to we just mm-hmm. none of us you kiddo, none you of us are looking for that to. opportunity yeah so no, I mean, hey, there's there are those things, and the reason we do those procedures in those cases is because there is no other option, and so right. you have no other options. You're willing to take take a chance, you know. From and it, and to be clear, it's uh, it, this is a not stuff we make up on the go. This is like no. this is part of our training. This is like there are certain very specific conditions where uh, we, for instance, do a uh, are trained to do a um, cesarean section, you know, where you deliver a baby surgically and it's a very grim situation because the mother has died and that's there's no other option. But mm-hmm. aside from that, we will always try to call in the appropriate person to do it. But hey, if there's nobody else to do it. We uh, we can we can do it. Thank God for you guys. If we're on a plane and someone's having a problem, I'll wait to see if you volunteer first before I raise my hand. <laughs> the problem oh, is I'm oh, doing the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> my kids ratted me out once. We were flying back from Jamaica. Oh, no. You're like, is there a doctor on the plane? I'm trying to sleep. I didn't hear anything. And my son raised his hand. I was like, you got to be kidding me. My dad's a doctor? Yeah. <laughs> I should have said yeah. I have my doctorate. I did that to my dad <laughs> once too. Yep. Really? Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. I was so ticked. They don't have yeah, anything in those bags. If anyone from the airline is listening, they have Phenergan, <laughs> Tylenol. Oh, and man. then I think IV supplies and an ended tracheal tube, but no way to put it in. <laughs> but Max, what kind of doctor was your dad? He's a, he's, he's a retired family practice. Oh, yeah. Okay, so he, yeah. he could do a he's lot. He's a family okay. practice doctor. We were like a skiing or something when I was a young kid. I don't know, I was like eight or nine, and like somebody fell and like hurt their knee badly. And I was like, oh, my dad's a doctor. And he's like, ah. Yeah. There's nothing I mean, like <laughs> having a heart attack on a plane and the wife and the spouse goes to you, what kind of doctor are you? And you go, I'm an ophthalmologist. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't happened to me, but I'm sure it's going to be a moment. Oh, I'll tell it's going to be great. Next time we're on a plane together, I'm going to let you try <laughs> while I hide in the back. And if it doesn't look like it's going well, I'll go ahead and get up. Just keep checking yeah. the pupils. <laughs> the pupils are still good. The heart's doing okay. Yeah. I can see it through the, art- through the central retinal artery. Doing pretty well. Uh, I think I've seen the uh, uh, was uh, the retinal pulse in the in the back of the eye once. Mm-hmm. I saw it once. I was like, oh, it did happen. I never saw it again. I tried. 
Good, yeah, good Andrew, job, you'd Andrew. lose your mind if you saw my ophthalmologic exam. <laughs> you, you shake your head. I deal with many <laughs> colleagues from the emergency room. I respect what you guys do a lot, but I'm happy to see the eye stuff you guys, to make we actual are, to make the eye diagnoses for you guys. We are happy for you to do that as well. Uh, definitely. <laughs> so, so like getting back to like the surgery of the heart, right? So yeah. I think. You know, if you're you're staring at a beating heart at this time when we're talking about this this stuff, you know, the if you you have what like four minute window to maybe do a procedure on the heart, uh, you know, if oh, you were yeah. to try I mean, to slow down and stop. Tried, tr- yeah, you know, so clearly you can't really operate on a heart properly unless it's not moving. I right. mean, at that point in time, and so if you clamp the aorta and stop blood flow, you basically are going to die in four. We brained it in four minutes, and so they tried these techniques. They tried hypothermia, right? What if I f- brought your body temperature really, really low, mm-hmm. like 70 some degrees. And that'll slow your metabolic needs. And maybe we can like, you know, have like keep the heart still for a longer period of time. That would work maybe 10, 11, 12 minutes, but that's yeah. not really long enough to do anything but the most simplistic maneuvers, you know? So it really is a credit to this, this particular, these innovators, many, many failed <laughs> ideas occurred, but John Gibbon is the guy who invented the heart lung machine. And he's, He's an incredible guy. And um, when you say heart lung machine, basically what he's like, all right, hey, I want to do some work on the heart. So like, mm-hmm. let's 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 give it a break. Let's have something else do yeah. the work of the heart, you know, um, because it's important to breathe. And the, really, the heart doesn't breathe, but it does get the blood to the lungs. So while you're breathing, you get the oxygen, the oxygen goes out to the body. But he had to try to solve a problem of like, OK, if I'm doing surgery on somebody's right. heart, can I hook them up to a machine that will pretend to be the heart and lungs while I do my thing on the heart? Is, right. I think exactly how he phrased it. Um, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, and, and like you actually have a cool description of this this device. Like, and he and it's like IBM is involved. You know, yeah. the, the company. So this is like a young guy in the 30s. This whole saga lasted a couple of decades. Overlapped World War II, and he 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 was a young he was a young student, and basically he had this experience where a patient basically died. And he realized from a pulmonary embolus, a clot in the um, a vessel that supplies uh, the uh, lung. And he realized if he had just could have found a way to take the blood out of the body, oxygenate it, and put it back, they would have had time to save this patient. So he thinks about how could one oxygenate the blood outside of the body. And he develops this machine. Like you can imagine this young man in this, you know, austere room and there's, uh, you know, jars there's tube rubber tubing there's cats to experiment on there's a motorized pump i mean he's just trying this stuff on cats essentially and he was able to create this uh machine with like a revolving cylinder that would basically spread the blood out in a thin film and pump it full of oxygen so he realized if you can increase the surface area then that'll increase gas exchange and he was able to keep cats alive on bypass for like 26 minutes essentially wasn't enough, wasn't strong enough to kind of do larger animals and certainly not humans. And then he gets connected to the CEO of IBM, whose name is Thomas Watson. And he believes in this John Given guy. He's like, I'm going to give you engineers. I'm going to help you. I'm going to fund you. And with these help of these IBM engineers, he comes up with this much better uh, machine prototype where they now have like these stainless steel mesh screens which basically introduce some turbulence because turbulence to the blood also increases gas exchange. Yeah, shake it up a little. Exactly. And it basically, it, in 1953, he does his first successful case to close a hole between the atria of the heart in a patient. And it's the, it just launches the field of cardiothoracic surgery, right? Within eight years, you have your first coronary artery bypass surgery. And then not many years after that, in the late 60s, you're doing your first heart transplant. And it's just basically made the heart of proper surgical target for surgeons to fix. The other thing to appreciate, like even in the modern times, we have, you know, obviously much more advanced than the the jars and the the shaky <laughs> shaking blood on screens kind of machine. But you, you when you see a bypass machine, you know, it's this gigantic hulking piece of technology that is doing exactly what just your your heart and your lungs do. But it takes so mm-hmm. much innovation and technology to do that for a person so that, that you can breathe for them and be their heart while you like, you know, take in the instance. And in, I think the final closing, we should just talk a little bit about heart transplantation. Like that's that's where we are nowadays, where you can basically yeah. 
You can take a heart from somebody who's unfortunately passed away, put it in somebody whose heart has failed for a variety of reasons, and the, that that person can exist without their heart for a period of time until you get the new one in because they're hooked up to this machine. And I mean, just uh, to you know, imagine having... I think you do describe the moment, just having a human heart outside the cavity and just the the first surgeon looking in and seeing this empty cavity where the heart used to be and thinking, wow, this is something. Yeah, 1967, Christian Bernard, who basically a South African surgeon, he's describing doing the first heart transplant. And he says he takes the heart out of the recipient, the diseased heart. And he says, I've never seen a body without a heart before, right? And today, organ transplantation is amazing. I mean, you basically go send someone sometimes to go get the donor organ and you have to make sure the surgeon has to go there and make sure it's healthy enough to be transplanted. And then back at your home hospital, the recipient is being prepped for surgery. Sometimes they take out the organ before the the other organ is like even in the room, you know, so it's it's amazing what can be done. It's it's truly miraculous. And um, yeah, heart transplantation is, you know, it's. It was like walk. It was in 1967, so it was kind of like the era where we were. We went to the moon in 1969. It was. It's just an incredible. Think about it. Oh yeah, it's just amazing. And not only just the mechanics of it, but like we won't go too far down the rabbit hole. But like you know, putting another organ in somebody and the immune system reaction, they had to solve all that as well. That's right. And so like that, there's uh, there's so much more, and I I think that's a great place to kind of leave it off and and just say like that we didn't even. We didn't cover everything in your chapter either. We didn't even talk about doing monkey lungs or doing <laughs> what? Uh, using parents as yeah. placentas. That was uh, yep. very yeah. Well, fascinating. Yeah. So, stuff. and that's, and we're talking one chapter, right? So there are yeah. so many other <laughs> topics, uh, you know, everything from obstetric uh, developments and uh, you know, infectious disease things, some of which we have covered on our show. But uh, I thought this was a great chapter and I really appreciate you letting us review it and Thanks letting us lot. use it. I love talking about it. So thanks for letting me share. Awesome. Well, with that, let's give, uh, we give our many thanks again to Dr. Andrew Lamp for sharing your book, The Masters of Medicine, Our Greatest Triumphs in the Race to Cure Humanity's Deadliest Diseases. It is available now through the link in our show notes. We will have a link on our website as well. So please go check it out. Go go buy it. Go read about this stuff. I mean, we're going to work our way through a bunch of these things here and there on the show, but like this is just a really good way to to see these stories and a lot more information than we can give you in, in the time period of our show. So go check it out. See those other stories there, and uh, and you'll find some that you haven't heard of, we haven't covered. And, uh, and with that, I really thanks again, Andrew, for joining us. Thanks a lot. Yeah, enjoyed, thank you. Enjoyed it a lot. Perfect. Well, we appreciate everyone listening, and we'd love to hear from all of you out there. If you'd like to check out our merchandise or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.poorhistorianspod.com. There you can send us messages and find links to our social media sites. We do work to respond to all posts on our various social media accounts as well. If you want to participate in the show, use our site, send us a medical history trivia question to test Mike's innate knowledge and try to win your own medical eponym. It's really bad at them, so you will <laughs> probably win, just uh, letting you know that as well. Not as It's got a better batting average than mitral heart surgery. We well, you know he doesn't. No. You're zero for... Two for 12? I mean, that's, there we go. So the, well, that, I've there got some that. time. I want to do two in one episode. <laughs> That's just in case I fail. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> so shows like ours grow when listeners talk about us. So consider posting something about the show on your social media. Or, hey, if you happen to be a keynote speaker at like some huge conference or a TED Talk, go ahead and put a gratuitous slide dedicated to our show in your presentation. It should be pretty well received, I think. And lastly, if you're old-fashioned, try using a flag semaphore to get our attention. It'd be really impressive if someone did that for us. I don't know what the flags mean, but I do appreciate the effort. So give it a shot. Until next time, Poor Historians are signing up AMA. I was trying to think of something else up the moment. Oh, yeah, no, you know what I wanted to bring up, too? Uh, You mentioned procedures that, like, when our back's against the wall, here's the procedure. What procedure, Mike, when there's... Oh, yes. Ophthalmologic that none yeah, of us want to do. You know, the canthotomy, canthalysis? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Gross. Gross. Aaron did, did one. That? Aaron did one. Of course he did. Yeah. He so did I've one. always, I remember thinking, that I've only done it a few times, to be honest, but I'm thinking, you sure we don't need to anesthetize this guy? Yeah. We're just going to crush it with like this clamp? Like, the yeah. Nerves? So this just might, hurry I up think, and do it. <laughs> it's like an eyelid could, circumcision. <laughs> 
Yeah, I pretty well, much. Yeah. So this so is like a guys, procedure for like yeah. if there's blood behind the eye, yeah, you get like hit in the eye. Yeah, it like pushes the eye forward and they can go blind because it like it just yeah because you're it's, no circulation. Yeah. It's basically like a compartment syndrome in the orbit, essentially. Yeah. So, so you guys, ER so do you guys have the Will's Eye Manual? Yeah, I do. I, yeah. I, I do have. Yeah, it. that's so I went to I did all my training at Will's Eye Hospital. So basically, we were oh, just literally yeah. like trying to write that book on it. this, and we're like, do we really want to say you can strum it because? Oh, that's not yeah. really how I feel. Or the, lig- is, the is ligament there, there that holds be, the like, eye in place. Gush? Yeah, like yeah. so yeah. we're trying to like just, it's written by residents, frankly. So, but um, that's what Aaron said too. He's, he was like, <laughs> I was told to strum for the ligament. He's like, I don't know what I. I just started <laughs> cutting. Honestly, you just start cutting. Honestly, yeah. as long as it just flops, nobody's gonna. It's kind of like her, probably his thoracotomy wasn't the cleanest, like the most. It, yeah, you know, I don't think neat. it was. Nobody's going to care that much at that point. Yeah. There's no such thing as a neat and clean emergency you're thoracotomy. Like, yeah. You're like, I can't argue with the ophthalmologist to get him to come in. I don't have time. I'm just going to do this. I mean, do your ophthalmologist come in? Ours willingly? did. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, that's yeah. good. You guys have a good attitude. Your doctors have a good attitude. I saw in residency, there was a, there was a patient who needed one. And I remember it was like, I called the ophthalmology yes. resident. I was like, I need a canthalotomy. And he's like, all right, go for it. I'm like, no, you go for it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I don't want to do it either, man. I'm like, all right. And so yeah, we, we kind of we ended up doing it together. And you know, in retrospect, yeah. it wasn't the. It was actually not. It, it's just we were it's kind of anti- anticlimactic. Yeah, so, you're yeah. like, oh, that was not so bad. I don't want to do it again though. But that uh, first cut though, and I'm kind of sensory, <laughs> so it's just like that weird. Oh, no. Yeah, it's like I'm mass. I'm a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to spare the audience the exact description of this procedure because. No, uh, we will we will lose a lot of them but uh it is uh it's i was trying that was my heroic eye case it's either that or um doing the um hyperventilation what? for a central retinal artery uh, occlusion that doesn't really yeah yeah I we mean, know that but we're supposed to do there's something. another thing you i mean yeah this whole <laughs> idea you could do an anterior chamber tap to lower the pressure in a central oh occlusion, yeah but, nope yeah not but don't either. Do the lens. <laughs> I, I, do, the lens. <laughs> I would do that before i would do a canthotomy honestly I don't know why. And you, I don't like scraping stuff off the surface of the eye. Yeah. Oh, you don't like taking out corneal foreign bodies yeah. and stuff? No. The first oh, time man, I had to use an so eye burr, I was like, there's no way. Oh, yeah. I, I love that. 